Hello! In this video we're going to take a look at uh, the limbic system. Specifically we're going to look at the hippocampus, the fornix, um, the um, mamillothalamic pathways as well as the amygdala. Um, and we're going to look at these um, from an anatomical point of view. We're going to try and find them using these MRI scans and we're going to try and interpret their three-dimensional shape. Um, now I always like to start um, with the ventricular system when I'm studying um, these deep structures of the cerebral hemispheres. And the reason for that is that the ventricular system, um, really its morphology is reflected in the morphology of a whole load of substructures within the brain. So what we've got here um, is a three-dimensional uh, representation of the ventricular system. Uh, and this isn't a cartoon. This has been derived from these MRI scans. So I'm using a standard um, free and open source brain atlas uh, to demonstrate these structures to you. Um, so what's been done here is someone has painstakingly sat down and gone through all of the different structures within the brain using this MRI data in order to produce these 3D reconstructions. So um, just another note about the uh, layout of, of my screen. Um, here at the top in, re in the red section I've got the transverse plane. Uh, in the middle section I've got the coronal plane. And in the yellow bottom section I've got the sagittal plane. I'm using the crosshair and the movement of the crosshair correlates across the different sections as well as on the 3D view. So if I move the crosshair around you can see that it changes depending upon whereabouts precisely within the brain I am. And the point of intersection of the crosshair in the three, indeed the four views, corresponds to exactly the same place. Now during this video you might occasionally see me glance upwards like this. Um, this is because I've got another screen above my current screen and I'm using that to um, vary the structures that are visible on the 3D representation. So without further ado, uh, let's crack on. Oh, and one more thing, by the way, this is a T2 MRI. Remember, T2, H2O, uh, so in this case, water comes up as high signal. So the CSF is white on this T2 MRI. So the first thing that, that we need to do, really, um, is, is, is find the headline structure um, in the limbic system and that is the hippocampus. Now hippocampus means seahorse if you're imaginative enough you can see the resemblance um, and the hippocampus is believed to have very important roles in emotional processing but really it's probably even more important when it comes to memory. All right. Now the hippocampus is sitting deep within the temporal lobes. So if I can draw your attention to the coronal section, the green uh, section here on the right hand side, here is the right temporal lobe and the left temporal lobe. These are the portions of the temporal lobe that we can see superficially. However, if you follow the temporal lobe medially, you can kind of appreciate that it's sort of like folded or wrapped around a bit like a scroll. So if we follow this temporal lobe around, we can follow it around and even in a spiral. And the thing looks like it's been folded, wrapped around a bit like an old fashioned papyrus scroll. And sitting right on the medial most portion here, this is the hippocampus. And there is one on each side, one in the left temporal lobe and one in the right temporal lobe. Now, as with all of this 3D imaging, um, we can see a two-dimensional cross-section, but this is only a representation of the hippocampus at one level. This is a three-dimensional structure. So let me move the um, sagittal plane so that now we're looking at the um, hippocampus in the sagittal plane. So I'm moving the sagittal plane across. Okay. And, and in fact, if it's actually a bit clearer if I use the other side. Now, you can see something quite interesting. This line here is where I am in the sagittal plane. So this view here in the sagittal plane corresponds to this line superimposed on the coronal plane. This elongated structure within the sagittal plane, I'll just zoom in a little bit. This is a part of the hippocampus here. And you can see that the hippocampus is actually bulging into the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. 
So the hippocampus is intimately associated with the lateral ventricle. So let's add on the hippocampus to our three-dimensional representation. And at the same time, I'm going to add on a structure called the parahippocampal gyrus, which sits directly adjacent and provides a lot of the input to the hippocampus. So here I'm going to add on the um, right hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus. And here I'm going to add on the left hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus. So we've got the cast of the ventricular system in the dark purple here. And in yellow, this here, this larger structure is the hippocampus. And this smaller structure here is the parahippocampal gyrus. Now, I'm going to look at these structures and, and I'm going to talk about them particularly in relation to memory. Now, of course, a lot has been written and a lot is known about the role of the hippocampus in memory formation. Um, but I'm particularly going to focus upon its role in the formation of explicit memories, such as, for example, those relating to factual information. Um, those of you who are studying neuroanatomy, of course, your hippocampus is going to be working in overdrive in order to try to make sense of all the things that you're being taught. But essentially what's going on in these yellow regions, and particularly the hippocampus, is we're starting to create associations. This parahippocampal gyrus is receiving input from many, many parts of the brain, primarily parts of the cerebral cortex. So, for example, it's receiving input from the occipital lobe regarding what something looks like. It's receiving input from, the temp from other regions of the temporal lobe, maybe um, with regard to what something sounds like or what it smells like. So this parahippocampal gyrus is taking multimodal inputs from all across the cerebral cortex and starting to funnel them in to the hippocampus here. Okay, And within the hippocampus we're starting to create these associations which are going to end up being laid down in long-term memory. Now the hippocampus, we have one on each side related to the temporal horn of the lateral ventricles. However, a, an area of the brain is no good unless it has got an output, unless it can actually send information to another region of the brain. And the major output region of the hippocampus is a structure called the fornix. Okay, the fornix. So let me add on the fornices for you. Um, and I just need to have a little look around here. Okay, so there's the left fornix. And then here we have the right fornix. Now the fornix is, is, is white matter, okay? So the red, that's the fornix here. And you can see once again that it's sitting very closely related to the lateral ventricle, curved just like the lateral ventricle. The fornix is white matter, and it represents the major output pathway of the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is creating these associations, it's trying to lay down memories within the cortex, and it does this by sending its output through the fornix. Now what does the fornix project to? Now, in order to lay down long-term memory, we've got to get changes occurring within the cerebral cortex. And you should recall from previous things I've said that if you want to talk to the cerebral cortex, you've got to go through the thalamus. The thalamus can be thought of as the gatekeeper to the cortex. So the fornix projects to the thalamus. So let's add on the thalamus. All right? Remember that we have a right and a left half of the thalamus. So what we have here um, is, is the fornix there, and it's projecting to the thalamus. However, it's not projecting directly to the thalamus. Um, it's projecting via a couple of small bits of grey matter called the mammillary bodies. Okay? I'm not, gonna, not going to add those on, but the fornix projects down to the mammillary bodies, and then from the mammillary bodies, we project up to the thalamus itself. And thence, from the thalamus, information goes back up to the cerebral cortex. So what we have got is we've got a, a reverberatory loop, if you like, a loop that goes around and comes back on itself. Information comes from the cortex down to the hippocampus, out through the fornix, via the thalamus, and back up to the cortex. 
And this loop has been known for many, many years. Um, and in fact, one of its names is the Papez circuit, um, named from a famous neuroanatomist. This Papez circuit um, is believed to be very important and crucial for the consolidation of memories, uh, but also to be important for emotional processing as well. Now, let's add on uh, one more set of structures. We've focused on memory so far, but let's think a little bit more about emotion. And let's particularly think about um, the emotion of, of anxiety. <clears throat> now, an important brain region, important for anxiety, is the amygdala. All right, so let me just add on the amygdala for you. There's a left amygdala and there's a right amygdala, okay? So the amygdala here is this pale blue blob that's been added on to the anterior side of the hippocampus. Now the amygdala can kind of be thought of as, as an anterior extension of the hippocampus and its connections are quite similar. Um, the amygdala um, project, receives inputs from many parts of the cortex, receives a lot of inputs from the frontal lobes actually, and it projects out of the limbic system via the fornix, just like the hippocampus. However, the amygdala, although it does project to the thalamus, actually projects to the hypothalamus. All right? So you can see that we've got this portion of the fornix that will ultimately project to the thalamus via the mammillary body. We've got this portion of the fornix here that will ultimately project to the hypothalamus via the mammillary body. So the hypothalamus sits down here. And if you think about what's going on here, the amygdala maybe is re receiving input from the frontal lobes, something related to an anxious state of mind in our patient. This is then sending its output via the fornix to the hypothalamus. And remember that the hypothalamus has many, many roles, one of which is to instruct the adrenal glands to release either cortisol um, or adrenaline via the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. So what we can see here is the neural circuit responsible for um, the, the anxiety response, if you like, or the fear response. One or two additional bits to note about the anatomy um, of these structures. Um, let's zoom in on the transverse section uh, and I'll just clear the uh, crosshairs there uh, and, and let's just look at the um, coronal section first. Here we said is the hippocampus okay and if I put the um, crosshair there oops sorry if I put the crosshair just there you can see that we're there on the medial aspect of the hippocampus. Now actually where we are here corresponds approximately to the location of the uncus. Okay? It corresponds roughly to the location of the uncus which is the medial most portion of the temporal lobe. If you look at the transverse section up here can you see how close we are sitting to the midbrain? All right? So the uncus of the temporal lobe contains some of these structures and they're sitting themselves very close to the midbrain. So if we get this uncal herniation, partly we are forcing parts of the hippocampus and amygdala medially to compress the midbrain itself. So that's all I wanted to talk to you about really with regards to the three-dimensional anatomy of uh, the limbic structures and their relation to the MRI images. Thank you for listening.